We're doing fine now. Good. Anyway, I'd like to talk to you about something I'm very passionate about, which is model predictive control, or also sometimes called advanced control. And its use, as we found in the last few years, and its use in utility systems to save energy. You heard from our, uh, one of our senior executives, uh, Patty Sparrow, this morning about how we focus on safety, security, health, and environment, and energy savings is a large part of our environmental concern. So we are very focused on energy savings. And the link that we came up with, with using model predictive control and utilities has become a really a, a neat place to be working at the moment. And we've, you'll see the couple examples I'll go through and then we'll talk about what we've done in the future. So let me start by giving you, uh, well, this is the outline of the talk. Basically we're going through uh, the background. We'll give you two examples. A fuel gas system that had a lot of problems in overall control and then a a steam system where there was a potential for optimization and maximizing the use of very efficient uh, energy production and steam production. And then we'll just talk about some recent activities and we'll give you a quick summary. So that's, that's basically the flavor of the talk. Basically we had opportunities for utilities control at two different sites within the ExxonMobil chemical world. Model predictive control, or in case DMC plus is what we use heavily in our company, was not even really considered. In the case of the fuel gas system, there were oscillations in the pressure of the fuel gas system as the system demands would you change. The users of the fuel gas would, would come up and need to come up or, or a process unit had a change in operation that was supplying fuel gas to the system and so they need to make up the change the amount of additional fuel gas that were bringing into the unit. Those, that system chain causes pressure fluctuations which ended up releasing fuel gas to the flare. Now when you put fuel gas into the safety flare system, you're just burning fuel for no good reason. It's wasting energy. So one of the things we did was we said, well, the site did a lot of procedural changes. They tried working real hard with the council operators working on trying to reduce the amount of, of, of energy consumption. They also added some things like piping changes and they actually added, believe it or not, a sphere at the site, a site that actually, they actually had a spare sphere, big old thing, that they actually linked up to provide capacitance. Didn't do much. But anyway, that's the kind of things that they went to for first. Uh, before they came to us. The second one was again a steam system where we actually had mo very efficient producers. You heard the term HRSG or HRSG this morning uh, from the talk from our, the CEO from the CEO uh, of General Electric uh, and we use them because uh, they're a part of a gas turbine. The gas turbine produces electricity but also produces steam and the heat recovery steam generator, the HRSG, produces actually additional steam and that's very efficient steam because you're also producing electricity at the same time compared to on-purpose boilers which are less efficient overall. So we want to maximize the use of, of the most efficient boilers and minimize, uh, minimize the use of the, the on-purpose boilers. Again, both the applications we ended up using DMC Plus technology. We also see, and you'll see this in the, in the, the traces that we show you, how we use SmartStep, the, another tool from Aspen Tech to actually use to facilitate the plant testing and commissioning. In the fuel gas problem, our job again was reduce the fuel gas releases to the safety flare system. We also had a secondary objective. The fuel gas system at this site was actually operated by the chemical side, hence the reason I was brought in. I work for ExxonMobil Chemical. So I was brought in and said, all right, what can we do to reduce the flare? And it was a huge million dollars per year loss of, of, of fuel gas to the safety flare system. The operators also said, by the way, can you line out and stabilize our molecular weight, our fuel gas composition that we're putting into our furnaces to make ethylene, the olefins plant. So that's, those are the two objectives that we went after for this particular application. Again, this site was a, a very heavily integrated refining and chemical complex. In fact, there was additional refinery next to it that was integrated into the site that was operated originally by a different company that was sort of grabbed into and then their fuel gas system was linked in with all this fuel gas system. The average molecular weight of the fuel gas system that was generally used was much different than the makeup. The makeup had, was used either propane or butane which has three or four times the heating value per volume as the, the, uh, the natural gas or the, the, the molecular weight of the, the, the gas that was actually used in the, in the process. 
So anytime you had a change, you had heating material that coming in on pressure control, which is actually a volume sort of measurement. So you have a pressure change, you're actually bringing in a volume of stuff that's about three or four times more powerful than the stuff that you're using. And that causes the swings that cause the flares, this eventually dump into the flare system. Uh, again, so that, that's resulted in the release. The original controls had two sets of uh, vaporizers on pressure control, and that's a sort of a standard arrangement. They, there's four, four uh, vaporizers at this site. They were all two different places around the site because, again, it was integrated. It was originally divided up into various different parts, and they eventually linked them all together. Now, again, the base controls had the pressure being controlled about 10% lower. So we had a PID, a proportional integrate derivative type controller sitting about 10% below the makeup and then the f release to the flare was, was set about 10% higher. We'll see this in a drawing here. Again, you can see that you, we also had a, a, a set of units in the refinery that actually produced fuel gas that we could also use in this system and want to optimize as well. We had the Saphir, as I mentioned, that was actually brought up. And in this site, it's very unusual. They actually sell fuel gas to the site, to the, to the town, and actually used in the, at the, uh, within that region around the refinery chemical complex for actual uh, for, for citizens to actually be using uh, for their kitchens and cooking. We also, this, a lot of consumers in this line right here, which is the main area where we're doing pressure control, and also this system, which is also sort of integrated as well. This is, again, a very, very simplified drawing of this process. And, and we'll talk about it in a second. That understanding this process was key to getting this thing to work. So again, understanding the process is essential for any model predictive control technology you put in. You've got to understand what you're doing and what you want to control first. And that was the first thing we had to do. In this particular site, fuel gas was sort of the tail end of anything you wanted to do. So it was always the last three or four pages on the P&IDs, the drawings for each unit. So we had to go through each of those things and come up with a site overall a drawing that focused only on the fuel gas system and knowing which things were dumping into the system and which things were actually using from the system. We also used plant historical data, which was essential to coming up with the initial dynamics and understanding the relationships and how much things varied. So that was another big thing. There was a lot of people dumping in various off gases going into the fuel gas system, and we had to understand that as well as how they affected things from a dynamic standpoint. We then used that basis to design the DMC Plus controller. Essentially, we decided, with a lot of help from the site, that said, hey, don't mess with those reliefs going into the flare system. We want to leave those in place. So we said, okay, we'll do that. But we'll go ahead and control the makeup. And we use DMC Plus to actually manipulate the, heat, the, the vaporizers, plus also that refining stream that's coming in. So those are our things that we move with the DMC Plus controller. We then, in the typical mode of, of doing a model predictive control, you do your design, you do a pretest, which you go to the site, you make manual moves. In this case, we test that design to make sure we got the right design in place. We look for all the additional potential disturbance variables or feed forward variables, as we call it, and we're checking those as well. We come up with uh, initial dynamic models, which we use as a seed models for our automatic tester, which is the smart step tester. And we, again, collect lots of data. We actually got heating values for every stream that was dumping into the, the system because what was essential for modeling it. Because, again, we're going to model this thing in, as a fundamental heat balance model, not on pressure or volume, but actually on heat balance. And so we're me measuring the sense stuff going in and out on a basis of heating value. And that's done inside the controller. Again, the final, the testing, or actually I should say the next part of a, a model predictive controller is actually testing the plant. We test and commission together, which is a methodology we use in-house, uh, which speeds the uh, actual execution. So we test it in commission, and this process was done very quickly. The whole thing lasted about seven days when we actually did the testing and commission. The final controller size is very unusual. Typically we have a lot of manipulated variables, a lot of control variables, and very few we call feed forward or uh, disturbance variables. In this case, it was just the opposite. We had six manipulated variables. Again, four of those were the, the vaporizers. Uh, Thirteen control variables, five of which were those pressures that were released to the safety flare system, and 46 feed forward variables. And that's, that's very unusual, but that represents all the things that can dump into the system or all the consumers. So, unusual design, but it's sort of fun to see. This is the results, and you can see that we started collecting data. Uh, this is one minute data. This is a trace on the pressure. One minute data over the course of about a month or so, starting about Christmas time, 2008, going through uh, late January, which is where we arrived on site. 
We started our testing, and again, this is the pressure on the system. I should mention, this is the flare. This is the most sensitive flare valve. And this is a big valve, so that when it releases, it releases a lot of fuel gas. And this goes up to about 66% open, and so it's a lot of fuel gas every time one of these blue line moves up. So this is, this is before, and this is a typical operation with the sphere in place, with all the operating procedures they had in place. We then came in and did the test right here. We started our, our smart step tester right here the first, about the 19th, uh, in the evening of, uh, afternoon of the 19th of uh, January. And after a few days, we got improved models, and you can see the re reduction in, in amount of uh, fuel gas going to the flare, to the point where we actually turn it on control here, and the pressure lines out. So that's a very tight pressure control compared to what was happening before. And there's no loss to the flare. So we've actually we're come to the point where we've dropped the f flare loss to almost zero. Now, we did lose communication for a couple hours on a Saturday morning, which is unfortunate. We came out and got that thing fixed. So we did lose a little bit right there. But that's about it. So it was an amazing difference. What made the console operators even happier was from the Olfen side, which was again paying our bills and actually was one of the control centers, the main control centers for this work, was we, we, we lined out their fuel gas composition. In this case, this is the fuel gas composition at the same time period of molecular weight changes. You can see it moves around all the place. This is to the Olefin's furnaces, to this is the boiler house, and this is to the refining process. You can see a lot of movement around, and again, since we're paying the bills, they wanted this one to be lined out, and we provided it for them. The other thing that was important is that we did not cause more oscillations to this particular sign, the boiler house, or to the uh, other, other users in the refinery. In fact, this is a lot more stable than it was before. So the whole system lined out and became more stable. So that's a fuel gas system. That's how we ended up using model predictive control to improve the fuel gas system performance at this particular site. Another site came to us with an interesting op 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 opportunity. Again, we, we mentioned that the console operators utilize biases, in this case, to, to, to maximize the use of uh, steam from the heat recovery steam generators, or HERSICs. And the way they have this set up, this is, done, this is the way we arrived at the site. This is what they had. They had a pressure controller going out to what they call submaster pressure controls to control the pressure, to, uh, the, the firing to each of the two boilers and the two HERSICs. Again, so this pressure is a PID controller monitoring the pressure on the super high pressure steam system. This is very high pressure. It's about 1,500 PSIG, if you're thinking about what, what this is. And it's, it's actually manipulating the heat, in the, uh, the, essentially the heat or the, the performance of these boilers and these HERSICs. The operators would then manipulate this bias that would go out from this master pressure controller on a manual basis and, and adjust it to try to optimize the system. And unfortunately, that didn't work too well. This is the way... The, the performance was before we actually came to site. So this is typical one-minute data going back for over about two-week period in late November 2009. You can see that, that we'd like to maximize, minimize these two, and they, they bounce around a lot. The man here changed quite a bit here. And then we want to maximize these two at the bottom. These are the HERSICs. And yeah, they do all right. They don't do great. These are the manual moves. You'll see some, a little bit of oscillation, but that's, uh, that's because I was using the, 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 the output variable, not the actual the op, the variable the operator set. So you can see the operator moves over this period of time. They make a lot of moves here when the system moved around a lot, but in general, they're, they're not keeping up with it. So what we did was, in this case, we, used the D, we said, we're not going to mess with the pressure control. The steam pressures are very, very fast, and, and model predictive controls now run a lot faster, and this particular application runs fairly fast, but it's not that fast. So we'll leave the PID controller in place and the submasters in place. We'll just manipulate the, uh, the biases. And essentially, that became a, they became our manipulator. We've never actually done that before. Typically, a, a DMC plus or monolithic predict predictive control vari uh, manipulated variable is something you actually move. In this case, it's a bias. So it's, it's, you're thinking, oh my goodness, what are we going to do? But it worked out pretty well. We added a, uh, additional, so we added the constraints, so the system constraints. And these are typically outlet temperatures on your gas turbines or a key constraint, so you want to maximize the amount of steam produced by those and electricity produced up to the temperature limits or an overall firing limit on the, on the gas turbines. And the other constraints are typically the turn down on the boilers. You don't want to go down too low. So what we did was we ended up using those uh, as system constraints and we added additional control variable to keep the biases about zero. Now in this system we, we had an interesting situation. We could either come back and go to the 40 or 50 different uh, feed forward variables well, we can look, and we said, my goodness, we look at, go back here. This output of this controller right here actually probably contains all the information we need 
about what's happening with this system, the disturbance that are happening, people coming up and down, because it, it's actually outputting and doing something. So we use that to, to mainly provide information to the DMC Plus controller this, this, to, to all the disturbance that are happening in the system. We have to back out the moves we make with our biases, but once we do that, it should be a perfect feed forward variable. So we only had, end up having in this situation one feed forward variable. It's called an integrated prediction error because again, that's moving out of the stuff that we're actually doing and moving, making moves ourselves. So essentially, we end up with one feed forward variable. And this was a first that we did, but now we've done it pretty much since in all our utilities, DMC plus controllers, we actually use real economics. And in this case, it pretty much drives you always to using the gas turbine. But in some cases, it, it may not be. And we actually have it set up so it can actually maximize the boilers if that ever turns the situation on. We're getting real time, real economic data from the real time optimization application that's done at that site. So, again, but since that time, since we've been doing this time, we've been using real economics for pretty much all our utility DMCs. This is our actual online data. You can see here's the boilers going along here. Now, this is an interesting situation. If you do model predictive control like I do a lot, you end up doing a lot of long coverage and weekends and nights and you're just you're there a lot. This was the first time I ever ran where we actually ran a 12 hour test on Thursday to Friday and then we had off the weekend. And then we came back on Monday, we ended up doing a test, not the working in the night even, and then we put it on control. The system was very fast, so it was worked out very quickly. So essentially we had testing for about a day. We had the weekend off, again a luxury. We had a part of testing here, we turned off, we didn't do it at night, and we put it on control here. And you can see right away, once we get it on control, the, the, the HERSIGs or the G, uh, turbine generators are at maximum, and these guys are running at minimum and really making up the demand. Uh, you see one case where this one dips down, and that's because these boilers both have hit their minimum turndown targets. So we're very sensitive now against those constraints as well. This is the moves uh, on the uh, biases. Again, this is the automatic tester right here. The operators made a few moves while we were off during the weekend. We came back and did the automatic tester again. We're off here. We did a little more testing, and that, that was Tuesday morning, and then we put it on control here. You notice I didn't include that average bias. I learned the hard way when they, all the biases went up to near maximum. Realized we had to put a constraint in for that, but that's one of the things we did real quickly. Since that time, again, we've, that was the first two utilities DMCs that we've done. Since that time, we've done a whole lot more. We've done uh, two more steam systems uh, at a, number of di a couple different sites. We've added, we've done one additional fuel gas DMC application at a large integrated site and uh, oddly enough recently a nitrogen system. That one unfortunately doesn't save any uh, energy but it was a neat application is showing it the diverse how you can actually push this into a lot of different utilities applications. What's neat is that when we link these to the energy site-wide energy RTO applications that we're doing now at a lot of our sites, which provide utilities, I mean, we're talking about electricity as well as overall steam management as well as uh, fuel gas management. We can get economics from that and then we actually use those economics to, to drive the DMC plus controllers. So again, just to this, this summarize, we saw a redic re huge reduction in the case of, of fuel gas sent to the flare, essentially wasted in the case of the fuel gas system. Uh, we saw very tight molecular weight coming out of that as well. We made the operators very happy on that one. On the steam system, we, we saved a lot of money and also saved a lot of energy as we used the more efficient turbo generators and, and back off to a minimum on our on-purpose boilers. And we continue now, as you've, you've heard, we look for continued savings and opportunities for DMC plus applications or model predictive control applications in a number of our sites. We're looking at on process as well. The key thing we find is that there are lots of energy savings, and almost all of our applications these days have been focused on energy app savings instead of particularly particular optimization or production maximization. We do that as well, but the, this is also uh, energy saver as well. The payback, even for energy savings, even in the U.S. with the current situation where we have low fuel gas prices, is it still a matter of weeks. The linear relationships that DMC Plus has or model predictive control has means that we can, in, ut in utilities, means that we can actually use real economics. And energy RTO applications can be utilized to provide the site-wide overall optimization and then they can give us real economic data that actually drive the DMC Plus controllers. Anyway, that's my talk. We have, as typical with any Exxon presentation, a legal disclosure. And again, you trust your eyes to, to read all that. And uh, anyway. 
Up next, 